you climbed to the top of the corporate ladder, you're on a very well paid job and then quit that. I wasn't excited to get out of bed to do my job. Now, I can't wait to start working on my business. How much is your business now turning over and what's the portfolio size? Close to a quarter of a million. The portfolio is worth about 3.2 million. I'm creating beautiful places for them to come and, and to create memories with their families. It's just super exciting for me. 7.50 a night and you're paying a grand a month on the rent. How much does that turn over then? 7K a month. And when you know the rules of the game, you can then play to win. And I was just like, well, what have I got to lose? It's one day, it's one pound. Even if I don't learn anything, I've not really lost anything. When you regretted quitting the job, did you ever think, oh my gosh, I should never have done that? Holly, welcome to Winners on a Wednesday. Thank you. So you're a business leader for the last 10 years. Yep. Financially free. Yeah. From the Cotswolds. Yeah. Talk to me about your background because you climbed to the top of the corporate ladder. You're on a very well-paid job and then quit that and shocked everybody. If you'd have asked me at the time, should I quit? I'd have said, absolutely not. But you quit a very high-paid job to go full-time into property and basically started from, from the ground up. So yeah. talk to me about your background in, 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 in corporate world. Well, I did a psychology degree to begin with. I wasn't really sure where I wanted to go, but I sort of ended up in HR for the last uh, close to 20 years since I finished university. And I kind of worked my way up, climbed that corporate ladder. And to, to be honest, at the beginning of that career journey, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed the challenge of climbing the ladder. But I think as I got further and further and, and towards the top, it, the balance kind of shifted for me. I'm at a stage now in my life where I've got two young children, a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old. And I really wanted to be able to be um, a mum that was present for my children. Mm. And I think you know, getting to where I got to in my career as a HR director, I just wasn't able to to strike that balance. It was yeah. a global role. And so it's kind of never stopped for me. So yeah, it just got to a point where I just wasn't happy. For, it yeah. wasn't for me anymore. And I knew for a while I needed to make a change. Um, I'd always had a passion for property. My husband and I have done a, a couple of development projects in the past and we'd always said we'd do more. Um, but it's that old cliche. We never kind of found the right time. Yeah. And that was always something we were like, oh, maybe we'll, we'll do it next year. Maybe we'll do it next year. We just never did it. But I think I got to a point sort of 18 months ago where I was just super frustrated with work and I was like, I've got to make a change. So I started Googling. That's where I found yourself. Yeah. And I guess the rest is history from Yeah, well, I think you watched a financial freedom challenge. I did. What happened when you were watching the video? Talk to me about that. It was Evans's financial freedom challenge. I remember that very well. I bet you do. Um, and I guess it just really opened my eyes to what was possible. And I think when you see somebody go from almost nothing to financially free in seven days, it just blows your mind. And yeah. you're like, oh my God. And, and also I think you sit there and you think, well, hold on a minute. If that person can do it, why can't I? Yeah. And I think, you know, when you see that kind of success, it gives you or it gave me the confidence. And it wasn't just that. I, I'd come along to some training. I'd met you. I kind of started to understand some of the strategies before I took the decision to leave my job. And I just knew that I would be able to make a success of it with the right education. Yeah. Um, I had that confidence because of the academy and because of the people around me and because of what I've seen. You can't unsee that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you just can't unsee no, it. You so. can't. No, you so, can't. Yeah. So I often find a lot of people that are in corporate jobs that have, have worked their way up and you were, you know, making six figures a year, doing really well. They're the hardest people to coach because normally they're so risk averse yeah. because they've got accustomed to, you know, that lifestyle, yeah. a couple cars, holidays, kids, house, mortgage, and, and, and going from that to going into property and being a property entrepreneur, sometimes it's really difficult because they're so comfortable. What made you decide to transition and, and quit your job? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think, you know, just to expand on what you're saying there, you almost become trapped. Yes. Because you've got that, you're, you're that comfortable, you've got a good salary and, you know, to all intents and purposes for everybody looking in, you've got a good job and why would, why would you quit? Mm. But for me, um, it was that work-life balance. It was a high pressure job, high stress, and there's more to life. Like I yeah. knew that. Um, I wanted to do something that I was excited to get out of bed every morning for. I wasn't excited to get out of bed to do my job. Now I can't wait to start working on my business every morning. And it's just such a change. And also to have the flexibility to be around for my kids, to pick them up from school, to drop them off, to, mm. to, you know, to do the things, the assemblies or whatever it might be. And to create something that's that's mine as well. Yeah. Um. I think 
that, that for me, that was why I did it. I think the other thing is I knew, I knew that I could be successful having watched the Academy and the videos and, and started some of the training. But I also knew that I needed to give myself the opportunity to focus on it. Yeah. And having such a busy job it's and hard. two children, I knew if I've invested in this Academy training, I needed to give myself the opportunity to be successful with it. Yeah. And I couldn't do that in this job that I had as well. Yeah. So for a lot of people, you know, it, it's, I think probably the sensible approach is to um, try and sort of build it up alongside well, your Well, that's job. what we teach. Yeah. <laughs> and you just be like, nah. <laughs> but it's worked. I mean, yeah. now, how much is your business now turning over and, and what's the portfolio size? So it's close to a quarter of a million. A year uh, turnover. A year turnover. Um, the portfolio, so it's a mixture of owned, managed and controlled. Um, and it's worth about 3.2 million. That's incredible. Wow. Yeah. And yeah. you've been absolutely killing it and hopefully having fun doing it. Yeah. Oh, and no, making 100%. lots of friends. A hundred percent. I actually, sometimes I have to pinch myself because it's a little bit indulgent, I find, because I love, really love the, uh, the design, the creating spaces. Like I've always been um, a big advocate of traveling and, and getting experiences in new places myself. I love going to, to visit places with character. And for me now, I have the opportunity to create that for other people. Yeah. In the North Cotswolds, the market is primarily tourism. And so I know that, you know, I'm creating beautiful places for them to come and, and to create memories with their families. And that's just super exciting for me. And uh, yeah, like I say, I feel like it's a little bit indulgent because I really enjoy it. It's that's almost like, should I be getting paid for this? <laughs> yeah, well, that's exactly what life's for, isn't it? If you can get paid for doing something that you love, yeah. never work a day in your life. Yeah. How's life changed then? So you're a mom, you've got two kids. Mm -hmm. What does the average day look like now compared to how it did a year ago? For me, I've always been a morning person. I like to get up and go. That hasn't changed. So we get up early as a family anyway. The kids are off to school, preschool, and I start my day. Um, I generally um, am looking for new opportunities, new business um, through um, looking for properties on, on might be right move, it might be open rent. Speaking to landlords direct, I do a bit of that on a daily basis. Got a number of properties that we are obviously actively managing in our portfolio. A lot of that is systemized, so I don't have to spend a huge amount of time right. there. Yeah. But I do like to make sure I'm keeping an eye on things and make sure that they're running uh, as I as I would want them to be, and the guest experience is what I want it to be. So I do that on a daily basis as well. Um, but I've got a lot more free time to kind of focus on the things that I want to do. Mm. So, you know, it was half term just a week or so ago and I was able to take that time with the kids. It's I was nice. still doing a bit of work on those yeah. days, yeah. but I was able, I'm flexible enough now to take that week off. So yeah, I mean, it's massively changed in terms of just getting up and being able to do something that I really enjoy. And every day is different. You know, if we are actively taking a property live, some of the things that I've just talked about, they wouldn't be a priority. We'd be we'd be more focused on designing and, and staging the property, sourcing things for our clients yeah. or, or for the properties that we've got. But What's your kind of natural exciting. flair then? What's your sort of your unique USP? Where is it that you're most happy? What is it that you're best at in property? Because in property, there's so much, there's so many things yeah. you could do. The pie is so big. Yeah. As you say, you've got properties you own, you manage, you control. What's the, where are you most successful or flourishing? So um, right now, what I'd say where we're most successful is our service accommodation business. And I really understand the market in the Cotswolds yeah. and the different areas. Um, so and before I did any of the academy training, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't have known that you have different types of guests in your service accommodation. Right. I just assumed um, that it would be tourism. I'm in the Cotswolds. I just thought that's the only kind of people that would use uh, your accommodation. And obviously, since doing the training, I've learned there's there's so many different types of guests that mm. you can have. So there might be contractors, there might be relocators, professionals that want to use your property on a short stay basis. And so I've gotten to really understand the market in the Cotswolds. Certain areas are driven primarily by tourism, and it's a year round destination. But there are other parts of the Cotswolds, for example, Gloucester City, which is just on the edge, mm -hmm. where there's a huge amount of development going on in Gloucester at the moment, lots of money being pumped into that city. And there's just so much demand for accommodation for contractors. So we've got a number of apartments in, in Gloucester and we've um, staged them. We've made sure we've got the right facilities that contractors need when they're on a job. So like, it's really getting to understand right. the market right. and then making sure that what we've got in those properties is really delivering what our, our guests need.
need. Yeah, and it's so important to know your area well. It yeah. really is. And that's why I think that you should have a patch like yeah. you've got. Because yeah. a lot of people get drawn in by the cheaper areas. They might think, oh, wow, Liverpool. You can buy a house for Liverpool for like 80 grand. Yeah. Or uh, uh, Grimsby. And they're really attracted by these uh, cheaper northern areas, which are great yeah. if you live there and if that's your strategy. But actually, the fact that you've made made it work so well in the Cotswolds, which is not a cheap area. No. It's, it's a pretty expensive area, yes. but you've understood the market. You've found your niche yeah. and, and are now dominating in the space yeah. is, is great. Yeah. And, and you know, we have got a, a, a decent sized portfolio now. Majority of that is controlled or, or rent to rent. So the next step for us, we'll continue to grow in that space, but we also want to start developing now as well in the area. Yeah. And you're right. You know, we absolutely were, we toyed with the idea of do we invest up north? Because it is cheaper. So the barrier to entry is lower. But I think when you know your location mm-hmm. and you know a strategy, then, you know, now I can combine the strategy of service accommodation with right. BRR yeah. and, you yeah. know, really make some serious money. And that's what you're doing. And another thing that you've done really successfully, which I think that is a little bit untapped and people aren't aware of, is just straight management. Yeah. Because there's quite a lot of money in management. Yeah. And yeah. it's it's the, the, the barrier to entry is low. Yeah, well, it's even low. it's even lower than if you do rent to rent. If you think about it, because you don't have to risk any money no. in management. No, you're just providing a service. If it doesn't rent out, out, worst that can happen is the investor's going to be a bit cheesed off. Yeah, but you're not guaranteeing any rent. No. How do you do that? Then what does it, how does that work? So if you're managing a property, do you only manage service accommodation properties? I do only manage service accommodation. Right. So I'm focused. That's my specialist area. I know the clientele. I know what people need, and also you know when it comes to places like Gloucester. I've got relationships with businesses there that, you know, that need accommodation. So I know that I can fill those apartments or those houses in that area. I think it is just about understanding your location at the end of the day. And I think as well, with you having a niche, Mm. you can now package and sell deals in the area. You can develop properties in the area. BRR development, you can can do rent to rent in the area when you've got that knowledge and understanding of an area. Yeah, and what's really nice is that I have um, a couple of trusted partners so that if I've got an investor that's interested in working with us, whether that's by the management side of things where we, you know, we just, we manage the property for them, we charge a fee for that on a monthly basis, um, or whether it's it's something else. We can offer a, an end-to-end service. So I, I work closely with people who are able to source those opportunities. I'm able to stage them and then I'm able to manage them. So it yeah. can be a complete hands-off yeah. for somebody if they're interested. In, in Have that. you had any nightmare guests? Do you know what? I think I've been super lucky. I've not had any nightmare guests. We yeah. do take guest ID. We've got agreements in place, um, you know, clear policies uh, for, for our guests in terms of what they can and can't do. If they were to breach those, you know, we'd be there straight away to, yeah. to make sure that either they stopped what they were doing or they were exited from, from the property. I think as well, for us particularly, it's the location that we're operating in. So the Cotswolds, generally speaking you're not getting younger guests that are maybe having parties there's less of that yeah. in the Cotswolds yeah. so the, the type of clientele it's not market area it's more market and there's, if yeah. you've got a, an area where it is a little bit more down market if you understand that yeah. and, and you could potentially cater to that or yeah. you could prevent certain things well, it's about think, knowing your area exactly and I think the other thing is you know we don't allow one night stays yeah. in any of Huge. our accommodations why, is, why, why do you not and why is that so important that's Super important because I think if you're going to throw a party, which is where things get broken and neighbours get upset, then you want somewhere for a one night stay. So yeah, we don't allow one night stay. What's the minimum stay? Well, it depends on the location, but for our Gloucester City apartments, where you're probably more likely to get parties, they're generally a minimum of five nights stay. Oh, wow. And that's because we're targeting professionals, contractors, families yeah. um, that are staying in the area for either they're relocating or they're working. So, so you might lose some bookings because there might be some genuine good clients that just want to stay for a night or two. They might. But it's the risk versus reward, isn't it? A hundred percent. So you're getting IDs off people up front. Yeah. That's going to eliminate a lot of bad tenants, parties, crazies, because they're having to give you an ID. Exactly. You're saying minimum night stay of X amount of nights, depending on the area. Is there anything else? Tips to prevent? Because that's one of the biggest issues people have. You know what? There's so many plus sides to service accommodation. Short stay lets. You're going to get way more rent. Yeah. It's way more tax efficient. Yeah. There's just so many advantages. You can, yeah. you can make three, four, five times as much. 100%. But everyone's scared. <gasps> but I might get 
a party going on. I might get a bad. So that's why I'm asking you yeah. to hopefully eliminate some people's fears around yeah. some of the things that you might do to prevent that. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I think that there are so many things you can do. You can have ring cameras, so you can see people coming in and out. Yeah. You can have um, noise detectors in in your apartment, so that you can detect if if there's all of a sudden making a um, a lot of noise by playing loud music. You can that you can get an alert on your phone, and you know. Or hopefully, your cleaner happening. will get the alert on her or phone. Or the cleaners get an alert <laughs> on their phone. Yeah. So there's just so many things. Yeah. I think whatever is worrying you or holding you back, there's always an answer to it. There's always right. something you can do, a process that you can put in place. Um, that means that you can you can manage that, you can yeah. mitigate that risk. And then the reward absolutely outweighs the risk. And also with ten- normal tenants, if they're trashing the place or if they're not paying the rent, you're quite powerless. A hundred percent. And the reality is, you know, I, and I and I often have this conversation with with landlords. If you renting, if you're renting to a, a company like myself. You know, it's in my best interest to make sure that that property is looked after. It's kept in tip-top condition because otherwise my business model doesn't work. Right. If you're renting to uh, a residential tenant, they don't really care uh, if the property is looked after because they're there for a short-term stay. They haven't invested in the property. They don't own it. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you get bad tenants, unfortunately. Yeah. And it's really difficult to get them out. You know, yeah. you, you're stuck with them. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, from a landlord's perspective, working with a company that's doing short stay accommodation, I, you know, I always have that conversation. They're actually better protected with somebody like myself than they are with a residential tenant. Was there ever a moment, Holly, when you regretted quitting your job? Did you ever think, oh my gosh, I should never have done that? I think, and I, it's important to 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 share these sorts of things because I think it can help others along their journey. It didn't happen quickly for me. Um, I so I made that decision and I was really confident that it was going to work. Um, and I, you know, you see a lot of success on the academy. And it's a great environment to be in. It gives you that motivation. Um, but for me, it took I think it was about four months for me to get my first rent to rent deal over the line. Mm-hmm. And when we did get that one over the line, we had two months rent free. We needed it needed quite a lot of TLC. So it took me six weeks to get that one live, and then it took me a little. A little while longer to to get my next one. Uh, I think it was another another few months maybe to get my next one. But I think one up, once I got that second one, things really started to change for me. It gave yeah. me the confidence, and I was just able to progress a lot more quickly. I think you know for anybody out there that's maybe just started and struggling to begin with, you know sometimes you do see quite a lot of success. Well, not sometimes you always see a lot of success. <laughs> you get surrounded you're by you're it. Surrounded by it. <laughs> And it can be a bit disheartening at times, right. whilst it's motivational because you're like, well, if they're doing it, I can do it too. If you're, you know, keep getting the nose, you, it can be a little bit difficult, especially I think if you're working by yourself. Mm. I've been working by myself in the business. I've had great support from my family, but day to day working by myself. So, and when you keep getting that nose, it can be difficult to kind of pick yourself up and go, yeah. right, no, this is going to work, keep going. So, I mean, and I had that persistence and, you know, I got the first deal, I got the second deal, but then that that's the point for me, the tipping point. It gave me the confidence. And then I was able to to go live with another eight properties, you know, in the next five months. Yeah. So it happens. It doesn't happen quickly for everybody. That's okay. Yeah. We're all on our own journey. Yeah. I think before I'd got the second property, I, I was kind of saying to my husband, maybe I need to take some contract work or something mm. um, just to ease the pressure that I was putting on myself. I've walked away from this job uh, and the salary that comes with it uh, to, to nothing, <laughs> to no income from, from me. And I was in a lucky position. My husband could, you know, cover the bills and everything. So we weren't in dire straits, but still you put that pressure on yourself. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there definitely was a point at which I, I kind of worried, you know, did I, did I go at this too quickly? But it turned around. It's a really difficult one to answer when people ask me, we were talking about this off camera, because I get people saying to me all the time, shall I quit my job? Yeah. And it's such a personal decision, isn't it? it really and it is. also depends on, well, oh, the first question I often ask people is, well, do you enjoy your job? Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. love your job, you, you know, I, I'm sure you enjoy many elements to it, but you said you were feeling a little bit trapped and wanted to be with the kids more and you kind of felt like you needed to get out. But, you know, do you enjoy it? Can you afford to? You had your husband who was also working, which took the pressure off a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a very personal decision. It is. And I think it's, you know, it, obviously it's about about whether you can manage financially. Uh, you don't want to do anything silly that's going to put yourself um, in, a, in a difficult situation. But for me, it was also about how I work. And the job that I had was a very, very sort of high pressure, high stress, very long hours. 
And I just wouldn't have been able to give him to give myself the opportunity yeah. to be successful yeah. if I didn't say, right, I've got to cut the cord almost yeah. here yeah. and say, right, now I've got the time to focus. A tip that I do give some people though, which is a bit of an in-between. Yeah. People like in your situation, they're saying like, I'm working crazy hours, I just can't focus on property. I'll say, book a week off mm. and do a financial freedom challenge. Yeah. Go mad for a week, yeah. unpaid leave, holiday, whatever. And in that week, you'll be amazed at what you can achieve. You might end up landing a couple deals. And you, actually, this is kind of working. Now I can quit. Whereas yeah. if on that week, you're like, I didn't get anything. That was horrible. <laughs> then maybe stay for a little bit longer. It'll just give you that little bit of... Yeah. But then some people do. I mean, I mean, quit. I definitely wouldn't advise. I don't think it's sensible to just quit your job. I yeah. know I did it. But it was more about me just being able to... I knew I wasn't happy where I was. I knew I needed to make a change. And, and I work better under pressure. Mm -hmm. That's just how I... How I Question for you. If you've got 100 grand cash and you want to invest it in the Cotswolds, what would you, because I know you help people do that. Yeah. What's the best way to invest 100 grand right now into the Cotswolds, would you say? So the Cotswolds is a really, um, I guess, a little bit unique to the rest of the country. And there's pockets like the Cotswolds all around, but it's not really impacted by a downturn in market. There's, it's a yeah. really strong, um, it's own little bubble. Market. Yeah. It's got yeah. its own little bubble. But there are still some prop. well, there's quite a lot of properties in the Cotswolds where there's an opportunity to push value up, to do development. Yeah. And that's where we're going to be focusing um, yeah. in our sort of next step. Now you've got your experience totally under wraps of, of the management side. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So we are going to be growing the management side, but we're also going to start to look for our first BRR. Okay. Buying something well, um, something that we can push the value up and, and effectively turn that into service accommodation because we know that works really well. So if I was saying to somebody, you've got hundred, if you've got a hundred grand, what would you do with it? That's what I would recommend they right. do. Buy something because you know you've got really strong capital appreciation yeah. in that area, yeah. and and that's just going to continue. Plus, you can you can achieve that super rent through your service accommodation, so it yeah. will cash flow really well for right. you. So you've got the best of both worlds. Sure. So you buy something what for maybe like three hundred grand like a rundown, dilapidated building. Yeah. You'd obviously use part of your 100 grand to yeah. put it as a deposit, maybe bridge the difference. Yeah. Refurb the heck out of it. Yeah. Would you turn it to flats or would you do it as one big house? Um, I would split the property um, to maximise the revenue you can get from a service accommodation. Um, I, I, maybe flats. We'd have to do, we always want to do our due diligence, whatever we're doing, to make sure that we understand how the properties would let out in that area. But better than flats um, in the Cotswolds is maybe splitting a property so you've got two like terrace houses. Okay. So you've got a bigger, because the bigger properties that are like two or three bedrooms rent really well on a right. service accommodation right. basis. And if you've got a little bit of outside space as well, that's really, yeah. really good. So. And then you'd rent it out as service accommodation, short stay lets. Yeah. Who are your guests then in the Cotswolds? Yeah. Are they, there's a lot of tourism there. There's, there's a huge amount of tourism in the Cotswolds. Um, obviously the summer is just crazy, like 100% yeah. occupancy in the summer. Um, but you get a lot of families and you get a lot of couples that come yeah. uh, walk in, just want to um, go and see the, see the sites. There's a lot of history in the Cotswolds. Yeah. We get quite a lot of Americans, uh, Japanese, yeah. Chinese people coming as tourists. How much are they um, paying then for a week? A week stay at a nice three bed house in the Cotswolds? So well, we have a place in, in Morton and Marsh. Uh, it's got flexible bedrooms or sitting, sitting rooms. So it's like four bedrooms and they... It depends. So our nightly rate is anywhere between two sixty in the low season, right up to seven fifty a night. Seven fifty a night. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. And the properties that you're renting, that you're doing as rent to rent in the Cotswolds. Yeah. How much are you paying rent? Give me, give me, give me a case study of one of your okay. rent to rents. So the one I was just talking about was actually my first rent to rent deal, the one that took me a long time to get over. Uh, the line and um, when we took it on it needed TLC so we did a big uh, renovation how much it. you spend uh, we invested about 10 grand into okay property. so quite a hefty amount but yeah. then you did get a grace period of how long so we got a grace period of two months okay good and we so actually have it on a commercial lease for six years jeez so this nice. is a property that we've got for the long term Proper. so we knew yeah. we'd get our money back yeah. that's why we were comfortable with the investment also we just knew because it's in a really good location in Morton and Marsh right in the centre and like I said it's a bigger property so it's flexible we'd also negotiated the rent down so it's only like a thousand pounds a month 
Okay. Um, and so we knew that it would cash flow really well, even if you just had a couple staying in there and you and you bought your um, nightly rate down. So that's what we do. We actually advertise it in two ways. We advertise it as a larger property for larger groups and also just as a slightly smaller property for smaller families. And we've got two nightly rates. So we're able to flex it quite well from yeah. that perspective. And that really maximizes our occupancy. Yeah, so, that's clever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and how much do you charge for that then a night? So that one is the one that's kind of between the two sixty to seven fifty a night. So seven fifty a night, <laughs> yeah. and you're paying a grand a month on the rent. Mm -hmm. How much does that turn over then that property? Generally speaking, the seven fifty a night is when we've got groups of like eight, nine, ten. Sure. Um, we have fewer of those bookings, um, and so you know we 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 might let it out for two, three, or four nights at that rate. Yeah, and then the rest is at a lower rate. 260 is our base. It's yeah, normally yeah. a little bit more than that. But that probably, um, it's about six and a half, seven K a month. It does for us. So the profit on that is how much? It's about three. Three grand a month profit. After your bills and you're cleaning. Well, and I, I mean, all that sort of stuff. the big question that a lot of people will get, and there's a very simple answer is a lot of people will say, why doesn't, why don't everyone just do that? Why don't all the landlords just went to that? But it's not easy when you don't know how. No. Like you were talking about getting all their photo ID, getting all the alarms, um, it, it's it's a business. Yeah, it's a business. And for me, like I just didn't even know that you could do that. Like I'd always yeah. wanted to have a service accommodation business. It's something that I talked to my husband about for, for a few years, turning our house into service accommodation. But we just, we hadn't done it. And I just didn't understand about this strategy of rent to rent. I didn't mm -hmm. know I could rent something on a long-term basis on a commercial agreement effectively because I'd only heard of or had knowledge of AST. So I think when you educate yourself, yeah. it just opens so many doors. Yeah. But also in my experience, some of the best landlords are people that have tried to do Airbnb themselves. Mm -hmm have tanked mm -hmm. therefore they've clearly got the right type of mortgage for it they understand it they're up for it but then we rent it from them and do it as airbnb and booking.com yeah. but we do it properly yeah yeah and then they're just like you know what i know you're making a couple grand a month off of it you deserve it yeah. because we tried yeah. and we failed yeah. they skipped the class yeah exactly and i think if you don't treat it like a business and you think it's just something you're going to do on the side you're not going to put any effort in yeah it will it won't make the money that you want no, to but if it you don't fail. put the right systems in place yeah 100%. i mean because there is a downside and that is if you don't take the photo id and you do one night minimum stay and you don't split it and understand who your market is yeah. and you don't have the sound alarms and you don't have good cleaners yeah. and then you have an absolute horrible nightmare 100 percent. where yeah. you're losing money yeah so it's not just the time spent on it i think it's setting it up in the right way and i, I noticed as well a lot of people that just uh, outsource it um you've obviously got a management company but if you just pass it to a management company without checking that management company out properly first seeing their experience making sure that there are specialists mm -hmm. making sure that they're specialists in the area mm -hmm. often the management companies will be rubbish yeah and then you oh it doesn't work it it does work yeah. it just doesn't work because you don't know how to do it you're just passing it to a management company yeah blind leading the blind yeah it's a business it's a business that's it and you've got to do your research even yeah. if it's so you're either doing your own due diligence so you know how to market it, or if you've not got the time for that and you're passing it to somebody else, you've got to do your due diligence on the individual that's going to be marketing yeah, it and managing absolutely. it for you. Because otherwise, yeah, it's going to fall flat. People could say, oh, when they look at Premier Inn, who you do the same business model. So Premier Inn will rent a building mm -hmm. on a company let mm -hmm. for a 10, 20 year lease, and then they'll run it as a Premier Inn. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, why doesn't the owner of the building just do that? Because they don't want to. <laughs> they haven't got the time. Yeah. They haven't got the inclination. Yeah. They haven't got the experience. They haven't got the systems and procedures in place. They'd rather just get their flat guaranteed rent. And that's the case with a lot of landlords. Yeah. Holly, talk to me about how you pitch landlords on giving you their properties on rent to rent. Because that's something that is a massive stumbling block for people on the early days. Yeah. You're always going to have challenges yeah. in business. Yeah. Your challenges will change. Yeah. We'll just hit the ACPP, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Yeah. But at the ACPP... Um, the challenges were I'm paying too much tax. Yeah, I've now got to go VAT registered. Yeah, and we had a big brainstorming session as to what we could potentially do about that. But somebody's just got to pay the VAT. Yeah, you know, you might have challenges with guests, but the first challenge I think most people have is getting a landlord to give them their property. Yeah, on a company let rent to rent yeah. agreement. Help us out. So 
I think it's all about trust at the end of the day. Um, you know, you've got, you're giving, so a landlord is giving you a property, something that they've probably invested in themselves in terms of they might have done a renovation on it or, or at the very least they bought it. So their, their cash is in that property yeah. um, and they want to know it's going to be looked after. Um, so for me, I think that is the biggest thing that, that I leverage and we touched upon it a little bit already that, you know, a residential tenant isn't necessarily looking after that property. Whereas we absolutely will be because we're in there before and after every tenant. It's professionally cleaned. We often, and, and something that's worked well for me in the Cotswolds, because it's a hard market in the Cotswolds, in the North Cotswolds, so the Cotswolds towns and villages that are tourism, there's a lot of money there. There's a lot of second homes. They don't need to rent their properties out, these second homes. They just sit empty. So it is a, it's a tough market to crack. And I've been able to build relationships with estate agents in, in the local area that will pass me opportunities, which has been great. But when you're having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with a landlord, it is about getting building that trust and helping them to understand the model, helping them to understand the value that you're bringing right. in terms of looking after their property and investing in their property. We just talked about Morton in Marsh. We invested 10K there. Yeah. It wasn't just a lick of pain. Yeah. You know, we put new sink in, we put new shower in. We don't own that property. They're mm -hmm. getting all the benefit from that. We probably Probably push the value up on that property Absolutely. for the landlord and we're going to look after it and keep it to that standard for the next six years um you know so uh, for me it becomes a little bit of a no-brainer if, if you're a landlord and you've got an opportunity to either work with a company that's going to really look after invest in your property push the value up you know it's hands hands off for them they don't have to worry it's guaranteed rent and that's another thing we talk about you know every month they're getting their money in the bank there's no void periods for them when they're changing uh residential tenants uh, they don't have to worry about looking for tenants every six or 12 months as we often do so there's just so many positives right for a landlord to work with a company like like us and, and like others than there is renting on a just a, a normal standard residential ast and you're paying them normally a similar amount if not a little bit more in some cases because it's, we can afford to it's a no-brainer yeah it's a no-brainer yeah so i guess what you've just said is you've listed all the benefits to the landlord. Mm -hmm. And it's important that you go in armed like that. Because yeah. when you go in and you're speaking to a landlord, if you're thinking, this is going to make me two grand a month. Oh, I hope the landlord agrees. Oh, uh, what I'm doing is a little bit naughty though. <laughs> if, if, if you're thinking that, yeah, yeah. the landlord's not going to do it. Because if you think, actually, what's in it for them? Yeah. You just listed all the benefits for them. And then of course there's benefits for you and it's win-win. Yeah. So how are you approaching these landlords? Are you like, like, how did you find that first deal? Did you find it through an agent? Did you find I found it, it on right move and it was via an agent. Um, right. So that one. Um, and then the others are direct to the landlord. How do you how do you get in touch with the landlord direct? So those are normally because they're advertising on open rent. Um, right. So I'll go through open rent. And open rent for anyone that doesn't know is a bit like right move, but where you're dealing with the landlord's direct. Yeah, exactly that. So yeah, so you can scroll through, you can do a search on a specific area, scroll through, see any properties that meet your criteria. And then give them a message. I always try and get their number. Mm -hmm. um, and then give them a call and, and have a, an open and honest conversation with them to talk to them about what I want to do and, and book a viewing with them. And I will have a bit of a conversation with them about the benefits and the value that we bring straight away. So that, you know, I think it's so important that you're managing expectations and that you're being uh, honest with, yeah, with landlords. Of course, yeah. Um, so, because otherwise I think, you know, you, you turn up and they think it's just a normal let or not i say normal but a residential it's not pretty when you do that no. because because then the landlord will feel tricked yeah exactly and that's not what we want we want to build no. that trust we want them to understand the model and the value that we bring you know we're not going into huge amounts of detail but we're having that conversation to begin with um and then going and having the viewing and and just building on that how do you build, deal building the report. how do you deal with rejection so when you get landlords just shooting you down on the phone yeah or saying like oh absolutely not Oh, I've had calls like this before, or just just rude. Yeah. How do you, as a person, how do you deal with that? Does it does it hurt? Sometimes it hurts. <laughs> <laughs> just honestly, sometimes it hurts, and especially yeah. I think at the beginning, yeah. you know, where you're just not as resilient right. and you haven't had the yeses to combat yeah. some of those no's. Yeah. You do. You put the phone down and think, oh. God, yeah. Is it ever, you know, are we going to get And that's there? also the importance of being in the right environment. Because I say, like, when because we, we do a lot of these calls on training. So when you come to, the, like, the rent-to-rent -rent training, that will be on the phone. When you're, I've not, I've not been a delegate at the course because I'm, I'm a trainer. <laughs> but I imagine, I'd like to think from what I've heard, when everyone's making calls and everyone's getting rejected. Yeah. <laughs> but then you're getting yeses. And when you're around other people and you're winning and it's fun and 
it's it's much easier to do it than when you're just at home yeah. and, oh, on your kitchen so table at 7 p.m. in the evening. If you're getting no's, but everyone's just like, oh, well, next, next, yeah. next. Yeah. And you're under that pressure, healthy pressure, positive environment. It's kind of easier to 100%. deal with. It. Persistence is so important. Yeah. And you have to keep picking yourself back up and saying, no, I've got something at value that I'm bringing to the table here. Um, and there will be the, the right landlord that I'm speaking to at some point because it isn't right for everybody. And that's the other thing you've just got to know. Yeah. You know, some landlords, they've got other plans for their properties and that's fine. It doesn't have to be right for everybody. You just need a one yes to right. begin with. And it can be life changing. Yeah. Deal. I was chatting with a guy recently who did the rent to rent crash course with us. And he said, oh man, I've called so many landlords. I'm getting so much rejection. And when we actually looked at his phone history and that, he'd made, I think, four calls. <laughs> And it's like, come on, bro. We then made some calls together on the program and he got a yes. But it took him another like 10 calls to get a yes. Yeah. And he said, but the nine rejections that I got felt like nothing. Because he said, when I was at home and I was getting rejected, my partner was going, I told you, I told you. Every time he was getting a no, it was like, I told you. It's not what you need. If you're at home and you've got a partner saying, told you every yeah. time, of course it's going to feel like you've made loads of calls. Yeah. So give yourself, give yourself the best advantage, you know, the slight edge by getting in the right environment. Oh, 100%. And for me, that was, you know, one of the biggest things uh, and one of the biggest reasons I joined the academy because I knew I was going to be working by myself in the yeah. business and I knew I needed to put myself in that environment where I could see the success and also on the days that you're not feeling great you've got that support network as well yeah so people lift you up and that's that's one of the best things about the academy it's just a really positive environment yeah and, and i'll tell you what the last academy training we did at the acpp which was two days coaching at my house yeah um it was just i think every single person in the room was making at least three grand it's just crazy and everybody's really just started their journey yeah in terms no of knew. what they, they can their first yeah. year yeah. there was 22 people i believe yeah and the average person was making about six seven grand a month from property and we went around the room you know did yeah. that little video yeah it's just like man when you're in that it's hard to fail i think when it's normal yeah you have in life what you accept what you tolerate i found this a little bit with my weight as well like if i'm hanging before I've, obviously as you know i lost quite a bit of weight but yeah. before if, I, if you tolerate it, if you think, oh, I'm not too bad, I'm only a little bit obese. You know, if you accept it, yeah. then that's what you're going to have. You're, yeah. you're having life exactly what you tolerate. And if you don't tolerate anything but success mm. in your business, everyone around you is winning and that's the standard. And I'm not going to tolerate. Mm. I'm not going to tolerate less than that. Then that's what you'll, that's what you'll get. Yeah. So what excites you the most then? I am super excited just for, for the future because, you know, I, when I look back on what I've achieved in the last nine months, and it feels, you know, super quick. It took me years to climb this corporate ladder that I climbed yeah. in my in my HR career. And now, all of a sudden, in nine months, I've created the business that I have. So for me, I'm just super excited about now I've got a business and I've got a plan to really scale that business and really create something that's life-changing for me and my family. I just, I'm so excited about that. Oh, you've done so, super well. It's interesting as well, isn't it? With, with the training programs, like you come to a crash course, everyone's background's so different, but they're all at the same starting point. Like you could be making 300 grand a year and be this, you know, the director of a massive company with 100 members of staff underneath you. And you could be someone who's just topped out of university age 19 but you kind of start in. Yeah, and you know what? I like that. I really liked having the opportunity to just start again. Yeah. It's quite, it's like, I think it's very humbling for everybody just yeah. to be on, at the same starting point, the same level, because we've all got the same opportunity for success. Yeah. And I think, you know, for some people, it might be difficult to say, well, you know, I, I've been this successful leader. You know, I don't want to start down here again. But I, I think that's, that's a mistake. That's crazy to have that point of view. You've yeah. got to be flexible. If you want to be successful in life and you want to have other opportunities, you've got to be flexible enough to take that step down, if you like, or yeah. just to take yourself out of that crazy stressful position that you were in before and start at the beginning. And it's, do you know what? It's a fun journey as well. It's a fun journey. It's a fun journey. Yeah. It is. What will be your biggest piece of advice to someone watching this if they're just starting out? I think... The thing that sort of held me back for a few years before I got to to getting onto the academy academy was that I always thought it wasn't the right time to start a property business. Mm. So for me, I think I would say to others, there's never a right time. Just need to get the education so you know how to play the game, yeah. regardless of what's going on in the market, and then just get started. Yeah, because good. you can make so many excuses for yourself as to why you're not going to do it. Yeah, but the reality is, if you don't start 
you, you know, you'll never learn. You've got, you just got to get started. That's so true. It's never a bad time to learn the rules of the game. No. And when you know the rules of the game, you can then play to win. Exactly. And you'll realise actually there isn't a perfect time. No. Now is the perfect time. It's always a perfect when time. When was your first crash course then? It was last summer. So I think May, June time um, that I, I, I remember having a particularly stressful, frustrated day at work. And I was like, oh, oh. I just don't want to do this anymore. So I started Googling. I'd heard about the rent-to-rent strategy. I didn't really understand it. So I was Googling because I was like, maybe I can do that whilst I'm you know, still doing this job. Um, and so I started Googling that. And that's when I came across yourself. Um, and straight away, I was researching you. I'd signed up to your 365, yeah, got your yeah. books. And I was like, right, well, I'll go on a, uh, I'm will i just going to go sign up to one of these one pound crash courses. I couldn't believe it was a pound. And I was just like, well, what have I got to lose? It's one day, it's yeah. one pound. Even if I don't learn anything, I've not really lost anything. It's just a day. And I learned so much in that one day. And I was absolutely buzzing. Um, I came away, I'd already decided to do the BRR training because that's really kind of, where my passion's always been and where I wanted to get to. And so, yeah, so it was last last June, I think, that I right. came to the crash course. Then I did the BRR course in September, middle of September last year. That's where I signed up for the academy. And then I've done the 12 months September, end of September to, to wow. 12 months ago. Well, it's been an absolute journey. And I know this is also just the beginning. Yeah. So um, what would be your advice to someone that's considering come into the one pound crash course, but they've not been and they're just like, oh, wow, I'm on, I'm on the fence. You're absolutely crazy not to. Why wouldn't you spend one day? It's research. I'm sure, you know, we all sit at home Googling or researching online for hours. And yeah. yes, okay, that hasn't necessarily cost you anything, but it's a pound and it's a day of your life. Yeah. And, you know, it's definitely going to open some doors for you. Open your eyes, open your mind. Yeah. I mean, it's... It, yeah. Well, I, I agree. I, I think everybody should come. People want to get in touch with you, specifically mm -hmm. whether it's they're looking for someone to help them with the sourcing or the management side of things, which you're so brilliant at. What's the best way to get in touch? Uh, so I'm on Instagram, so you can DM me on Insta Instagram. It's holly.characterproperties. Um, um, we've got a website, which is www.characterstays.co.uk. Well, I'll leave all your links in the description to the video okay. and uh, look forward to seeing you continue to smash it. If you're watching this, I want to invite you to come and spend the full day with me at the Property Investors Crash Course, where I condense everything I know about property into one day. You're going to learn a ton. It literally costs one pound to get your ticket. I'll also leave the link in the description. Until then, see you next time.